thank you very much. I'm excited to, to be here today. Uh, thank you for the invitation to speak at this grand opening of the Max Planck Odense Center uh, for on the biodemography on the biodemography of aging. Um, is this working? Yeah. And um, we just came with a big uh, shuttle from Rostock uh, with all the biodemography people from the Evo Demo Lab, and uh, we are glad that we found the place here so that I can talk now to you. Did it switch? Yeah. And uh, for those of you who are not demographers, so Jim Vopel at the opening of our Max Planck Institute for Demographic Research in Rostock, he defined demography as demography is about birth, about death, and about mathematics. And in Rostock, we have a beautiful building, and the east wing of the building points to the sunshine, and there they study birth and family dynamics, and then we have the west wing, and that points to where the sun sets, and there we study death, or if you like, we study survival. Um, and we all successfully are surviving so far. And uh, the river actually flow, flows from the east to the west, so it's beautiful. And um, is this pointing? Yeah. Good. And there is where the mathematics comes in. That's a favorite equation of all demographers. It's a Lotka equation, and it sums um, births. That's the M stands for maternity function. A is age here. At every age, you have a certain amount of reproduction that you can do. And in humans, it's usually hump-shaped. That's just a cartoon. So it starts at age 15, rises, and then falls around age 50. Uh, so that's for females. Um, that's the birth side. And then we have the death side, uh, survival. And survival, demographers like to denote with L. So this is the probability that you survive from birth to age A. And um, I'm not bothering with too much mathematics here, but this is integrating over all the hazards of death that you have to ex escape from uh, between birth and your age A. So when you successfully, in the beginning of life, when you're just born, uh, your hazard of death is really high. Well, we are working on it to really reduce it to low levels. Um, it drops quickly around age at maturity, mortality starts rising, and for those who study mortality, they also know that there is a leveling off here later on. So these are the functions that basically describe how organisms, humans in fact, change with age. It's like the compound effects of physiology, genes and everything shows up in these patterns. And that's what demographers are excited about. And if you integrate from the alpha to omega, from the beginning to the end, if you integrate all births and survival, then you get how populations change over time. And then you can study population structure and population dynamics, and that's what demography is about. Biodemography is taking the viewpoint that birth and death is essentially very biological. And uh, understanding how these patterns change over the life course of organisms is an evolutionary question because all organisms eventually evolved. And therefore, biodemographers want to understand the fundamental principles underlying these curves. That's what we want to study. And uh, with these curves, I now want to define aging. Um, and just for the next 10 minutes, I know for native speakers it might be difficult to redefine the word aging, but uh, I try to be consistent in the next 10 minutes using aging as defining change over age, reflected in mortality and fertility. And I reserve the term senescence for things getting worse, and things getting worse from maturity onwards to the end. Um, so aging is just things change. And Medawar already pointed out that it's really weird in the English language that you don't have a word that simply says change if things change over age. OK, so as you see here, um, there is, of course, a genetic level. The genes determine the phenotypes, the physiological level, and then all this compounds in the mortality pattern. And this is how demographers define uh, senescence. And of course, everything depends on the environment. The gene is in an environment. Every organ has an environment. We are living in an environment. So how you die depends on what environment you are in. When you are like, a, say, a clay cup, and you are in a sealed room, you can live for a very long time. But if you put this clay cup in the heavy rain outside, it will fall apart very quickly. And the major question that we are asking is, why do we have to grow old? Why does this mortality pattern have to increase with age? And why does fertility fall with age? That's, that's a fundamental question that biodemographers like to answer. 
And uh, in the face of population aging, the question is how malleable are these patterns? So how much is the increase in life expectancy going on? How much more can we reduce mortality? All these questions fall into biodemography. And um, if you come from an evolutionary angle, the question is, why is there even mortality going up at all? Because now there's again our Lotka equation that we are so excited about as demographers. Um, here's survival and there's reproduction. And by definition, aging, senescence reduces survival and reduces um, fertility and uh, therefore it reduces, does it, fitness, which is here captured by the population growth rate, little r, that's another very favorite letter for demographers, little r captures how quickly populations grow, if it's zero, populations don't grow. Um, and the question is, if senescence reduces evolutionary fitness, then why can it exist at all? And people looked at that since uh, the 50s of uh, the last century, and the main player was Hamilton. And Hamilton said, it's not just not a puzzle, but it's actually inevitable. Senescence must exist. And he said, senescence must exist because the force of selection declines. Now, force of selection is somewhat jargon, so let me put that in different terms. Basically, what he found is that later ages don't matter to evolution. And if you imagine your life as a train, and at every age class you contribute a certain amount of babies, then in order to make all these babies so that you have your full lifetime reproductive success, you have to survive. So the links in the chain is the survival. Now if there is something in your genome, like a mutation, that uh, makes you more likely to die at a certain age, you lose all the remaining reproduction after that. And if these kind of changes happen later in your life, especially when this happens at an age when you don't have any reproduction ahead of you, there is the, just no change in evolutionary fitness and therefore there shouldn't be any effect to evolution. So evolution is blind to what happens after that age. And because of that, because the force of selection declines, um, there were very um, clever people like Medavar who got the Nobel Prize um, he said that if there were mutations in your genome that happen later and later, they would be less and let, less opposed, and so um, there should be an increasing mortality pattern, which should be inevitable. And alternatively, we have Tom here in the room. Um, I think it's a big luxury because looking around here, we have so many key players in this story. Um, Tom and, and George Williams, they pointed out that in fact, it could be that if you have benefits early in life, but you have to pay for them later in life, like a mutation that does more than one thing, then evolution would select this because you get a high benefit early in life that gets a high weight by evolution. So if you just pay a little price and you don't care about that later, especially if that happens late enough that your reproduction is not affected. So these theories predict that senescence should be inevitable, meaning that the increase in mortality is inevitable and the falling reproduction should be inevitable. But not just for humans, but for any conceivable species. Because if you think of the Lotka equation, which is so beautiful in demography, that just includes survival and reproduction. And any organism has to survive and reproduce, so this equation is valid for anything else also that, that lives. Therefore, basically for all species, mortality should go up. But we do have a secret laboratory in Rostock, and uh, in the dungeons, we do experiments with these guys, which is Hydra. And they sit there, and uh, Ralf Scheible is taking care of them, and they don't die. Or they actually do die, but at a very, very low rate. And if they would keep on dying at that rate, they would leave, we estimated, uh, 1,417 years. So far, we have done six years. Um, <laughs> so we hope for a lot of more funding in the future. Um, but what you can see here, if you look at the legend, the red line is mortality, the blue line is fertility, the dashed line is the average, and they all fall on top of each other. So over the life course, nothing changes. Always the reproduction at any age is the same, the survival is the same. And uh, if you're more familiar to survivorship curves, that's just depicted in the background. And that's our work by Owen, who is also here in the audience, there. Um, so Hydra has a flat mortality profile, which is totally not expected by the theories. <laughs> and Tom might say, tell you something else later.
But it's not just the little creatures like Hydra, it's also uh, the tortoise and strikingly um, oak trees. And if you look at the red line and the blue line, they look pretty similar in both pictures. So even though these are an animal and a plant, they show the same life course patterns, if you like. They have the same demography except for the time scale. While the tortoise basically is dead at age 64, the tree lives 177 years, roughly. So these patterns are so far not explained by the classic evolutionary theories because this is flat and falling patterns of senescence or more broadly aging. And we try to understand why can this be. Um, so there are these three, three generic shapes if you want to zoom out. Mortality can be flat like in Hydra, can go up like in humans, can fall like for instance in the tortoise. And we need a theory that explains this and the classic theories, they work for senescence, but so far we are needing to fill this whole circle and there are new explanations or adjustments to the theory necessary to explain we call it sustenance because the organism sustains its state. Um, so ongoing funding, inflow is equal to outflow. Um, and we need explanations for that. Where am I going? So the classic theories, they started off by this force of selection thing. So the train and later ages are less important. But what we think is that what matters for aging, and this is a new perspective, on the root of aging is that there's always limited resources, not just in biology, but in all kinds of contexts. And if you invest something in one thing, then you cannot invest it in the other thing. And in biology, the two things you have is survival and reproduction. If you invest in survival, you don't invest in reproduction and vice versa. And the crucial question is, how much survival do you lo lose if you want to get one more unit of reproduction? Or how much, reprodu how much reproduction do you lose if you get one more unit of survival? And it's simply marginal costs and benefits that you are calculating there, and then you are very close to economics. Um, but this is what species seem to do, and they do that in trying to maximize their population growth rate and trying to outrun all the other guys. So there has been a lot of work, and um, Tom's uh, theory on the disposable soma, which he will probably mention later, uh, initiated that on, in the aging uh, framework. Um, but many, many other people pointed out the importance of trade-offs and model these trade-offs to explain these life history patterns. Um, but so far, oh yeah, let me go there. Just to, for people who work with humans every day, even though it's obvious that there are animals and plants, let me just mention that there is this variety of species. And this, these guys, they have very different marginal costs and benefits. If, uh, if a pike wants to make another egg, that's essentially no difference in cost because they are just like, don't know how many eggs the fish has, but it depends on the size of the fish, how many eggs there are. While if a human has a single baby or twins, that's a big difference to the mother and the father for that matter. Um, so the marginal cost of an additional child is very different in these species. And also for a tree, the marginal cost of making another flower is negligible. And therefore we think, because the marginal costs and benefits are so different, these trade-offs are different in the species and therefore they're aging differently. So we can change our perspective from the Hamiltonian view that is very age-based because it is thinking of early ages compete with late ages and because late ages don't matter, you favor the early ages. But if you switch the perspective to the trade-offs, and you say that it matters, what matters is the state of the organism. So age is just kind of counting the years, how long you have been there. But what really matters, your aging, is your current state, your condition, or your, the stage you are in when you are a plant, whether you are a seed or a seedling, etc. cetera. Um, and with this approach, we believe that we can explain the variety of patterns, and we have started developing models that can capture these patterns. So the challenges and the opportunities we have if we want to study aging across the tree of life is we know the patterns of mortality and fertility for people very well because we have the human mortality database and the wells of data, but for other species, we don't really know because you have to follow them. So there is a project in Rostock which is called Dat Life, and they're collecting life tables for all kinds of animals that we can get hands on that have been published. We also have 
a project that is called Comadre and Compadre, and uh, that's led by, you would have guessed probably, a Spanish man, Rob Sagero Gomez, he is now in Brisbane, and um, Hal is heavily involved, many of the people here are heavily involved, um, but also, so the, the Comadre Compadre is collecting projection matrices for plants, and also now for animals, but what we also need is longitudinal data, and uh, Debbie Roach, where is Debbie? Um, so Derby has this uh, longitudinal data set on Plantego lanceolata, Spitzwegerich, but there are also many other individual level data sets uh, where Owen Jones has a lot of contact and Fernando Colchero, etc. Um, so we need these data sets in order to study the life course of, of animals and plants. Um, but there's also another data source, which is the ISIS, uh, which is the uh, species, this is a zoo community that collects data uh, Dalia Conde is heavily involved with that and in contact with the zoo so we can get zoos to data on animals and then we can co compare them to data from the wild so we understand this clay cup example if you have a species that is protected versus a species that is not protected. We can see how much aging is affected. And let me just go quickly. If you have the data, you also want to analyze them, but if you have not so beautiful data like we have for humans, but very like sparse data. You need to have Bayesian statistics and other mathematical magic to get at it. And you also need to provide software, which has been mainly done by Fernando Colchero and Owen Jones and Maren. And uh, there is a matrix population Bible by Hell, and he will say more about it. These methods are really important. There is IPM models now coming out. Um, you need measures, which is um, to classify aging if you want to do comparative studies. I go quickly. And you also need models. Um, this is um, the model by Jan Lecumpf, who just got his PhD. And uh, let me just go to the last slide. And that is why demography, why biodemography, why aging. And we do have population aging. We have climate change. And these are two really big processes that we have to deal with. And in terms of population aging, biodemography puts human aging into biological context to better, better understand why we are now so far away from other species, even from our ancestors in terms of our mortality fertility patterns. And climate change is just an example that our environment is constantly changing and the environment is also changing for animals and plants. And if we have a, an idea of what determines these patterns, we can also predict how these patterns might react to changes in the environment and how we can handle pest species and how we can handle pe species extinction, etc. So these things go widely. And with that, I acknowledge the people in Rostock. Thank you for your patience. And uh, 